Okay, we're going to try to cover the first 10 to 12 years, well, maybe 10 years, of the early church tonight. So we better get going here. All right, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, um, thank you for this beautiful day. What glorious weather we're having out there. The, the air just feels so good, and, and the breeze is, is just beautiful. And thank you for all the, the blossoms on the trees and the bushes and the flowers. Just gorgeous. Um, makes us feel so thankful um, to be alive and to have your blessings. Father, um, be with all those this week. There's just a, a long number of people having procedures this week. And um, we just want to lift them up to you. We want to lift up Lucy and um, Greg and um, um, Gary and Greg Henley and um, Rita to just so many, Father. And so we ask you to get, uh, be with them and help them to receive good results. And we also want to um, thank you for the birth of Diana. And we also want to thank you for um, the safe returns of Stana to us. And Father, tonight as we open your word, um, help us really grasp what you have done um, so many things culminate, so many things come together um, in the study that we're doing tonight in the Book of Acts and help us get, get the bottom line, help us understand what is behind it and what you are doing with it. Father, forgive us of our sins. We need the blood of Jesus Christ always. And um, we thank you for him and, and all that he has done and all that he continues to do. And we offer this prayer in his name. Amen. Okay. So we're going to be doing tonight the beginnings of the early church. And um, I wanted every, every night, I'm going to try to give you a couple things to get you ready for the test. But it's coming. Um, so, um, just let me get my calendar. So I'm going to give you dates. So we'll be doing um, lesson 26, which is our last lesson in the series, Lord willing, June 1st. And then um, you're going to have two weeks to study because uh, VBS is on the 8th. So we will not meet as this class on the 8th will help out with you. Yes, right? So um, so you're going to have two weeks. And then our super colossal mega review is going to be on June 15th. And I'm going to prepare you, prepare you for the test. And then the test, and if this is a problem with anybody, please let me know. We just, we're just out of dates. Our test is going to be on Sunday afternoon before church. That will be June 19th. And I'm thinking 4.45 to give us at least a full hour to do it. Okay. And those of you who don't want to do the test, come anyway. We'll set up tables and chairs back there and you can do it as a written review. But I want to encourage everybody to attempt it. And if in the middle of it you say, oh no, I already blew it, I'm not going to, because it only needs 70%. You can set your stuff back there, you know, all of your lessons and your books and your, all that stuff, and you can take it back there and finish it back there. Okay? No, 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 no. But I'd rather, I'd rather you try it. And then, I'm taking up too much time here. Um, our party is going to be on June 22nd. So there you got it. That's what's coming up. 
All right. Okay, let's get into this. Okay, you remember that the New Testament, if you want to look at the poster up here, the New Testament era is divided um, easily into three periods. We've already done the first period, right? The second period now is the beginnings of the church. And that's what we're going to do. And if you look at it, it'll say, what does it say? Acts what? 1 through 12. So that's what we're covering tonight. So let's get going here. If you did your lesson, of course, this is going to help. And um, you have your map as well. Um, and we'll try to be covering the map as we go. So, so what happened? Um, on the day of Pentecost. Well, I'm going to list off a few things that happened that day. Um, first of all, I think it's very interesting to note that it was exactly 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it was 10 days after he ascended back to the Father. Right? He stayed 40 days, and he appeared and you have all those appearances in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. And he was also further uh, preparing his disciples, and we'll talk about that in a second, for, for his leaving. And for the great, honestly, the great commission that they were about to embark on. Right? And we see that up here, don't we? So let's, let's just look at that. So it says, and I forget which translation this is because I made this up years ago. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey um, everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you all very end of the page. I think that's it. I think, I think that's it. Um, so that is where he's sending them out. And then I want to just go ahead and read the next one because if you start in the book of Acts, of chapter 1, well, there's two things I want to say about that. One is in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Stay in the city, stay in Jerusalem, until you have been clothed with power. So that's that's a signal right there that the Holy Spirit is going to come, right? And then, and what I would just live, I would love to read Acts one and two and just do that tonight, but but no. Anyway, um, in in verse eight, Jesus actually gives the progression of the gospel, where it's going to start, and kind of the stages at which it's going to go out. And we're actually going to see that happen tonight. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And Jesus is talking to the 12. Let's see. Yes. No, he's actually talking to the 11. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So it's going to start in Jerusalem first, right? Okay. In all Judea, so all that southern area of, of Israel. Samaria. You guys have your map? Yeah, and to the ends of the earth. All right, we'll, we'll leave it right there and we'll come back. All right, so that's kind of the outline. And if you look at that, that is the outline of the book of Acts. And it follows it. And one other thing I want to point out, though this is not in the lesson, I, I think it's really important. You know how Jesus said, wait in the city and tell your clothes and power and all that. The apostles were very good at waiting. 
there were things that happened, events and um, instructions given to them at the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit that initiated each stage, and they waited until God gave them that event or that signal from the Holy Spirit that the next stage of the progression of the gospel was to begin. And I think that's really, really important. For me, it's like, hey, we're in Jerusalem. We got the gospel. Let's go. But, you know, it wasn't like that. God, the timing of God is, is superb. If, if they would have gone out too early, they would have just crashed and burned. They were not ready. They were not ready. Some scholars believe they stayed in Jerusalem eight years. What? Well, and then what happened? Well, we're going to see. We're going to see. All right. So let's, if you want to go with me, um, let's go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to see what happens on this great day. The, uh, day of Pentecost. It's now 50 days. By the way, Pentecost is a Sunday. Isn't that interesting? The very first day of the church was what? A Sunday. Amazing. All right, so um, it's 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and what is happening on this Sunday, this day of Pentecost? Well, let me just list off a few things. A new age is beginning, a new dispensation. Do you remember our dispensation chart we had? It is now the Christian age, the Christian dispensation. There's a new covenant. The covenant is being initiated and put into force this day. There is also the coming of the Holy Spirit and the first day of the church. And so if you're in Acts 2, I think probably the most important thing um, that sometimes is overlooked about this day is found in Acts chapter 2, verses, verse 21. So I need to get there. And it says, and this is, this is fulfillment of prophecy. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you see that? That, Acts, am I right? Acts 2, 21? Yeah, okay. Um, this is the first time in history this is true. Up until this moment, God had... Um, a nation of people that was geographic and by blood through the blood of Abraham. Now, beginning this day, anyone, Jew, Gentile, anyone can call upon the Lord and be saved. And that that's amazing. That is amazing. All right, let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 2. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And we're talking about the apostles, because if you look at verse 26, the verse right before it, that's who we're talking about. We're talking about the 11 apostles plus Matthias, right? Okay, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them on each one of who the apostles yeah and they were all filled with the holy spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit was giving them Utterance. Now you got your map. Got your map handy. The one I can't. That came out tonight. The one that was on the table when you got here. Okay. Let's find them. Let's find them. 
All right. Um, uh, verse 5. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men who had come from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak to him in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished and said, why are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? So who's speaking? Apostles, because they're all Galileans, right? That's where Jesus started his ministry, right? Now how is it that we hear them in our own native language to which we were born? Okay. Now let's look at our map. Parthians, you see it's over in the east, it's on the right side. Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia. And then you gotta jump back to Israel. Judea, Cappadocia, that's up north. Pontus, Asia to the west, we're talking Asia Minor is what we're talking about. Phrygia, Pamphylia, that's down south from, from Asia. Egypt, let's go to North Africa, drop down North Africa. Egypt, the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and then way over, visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes. So what are proselytes? Converts, exactly. Converts to Judaism uh, from other nations. All right. Uh, Cretans. Um, you see the Crete out in the, in the in the Mediterranean, and Arabs. That's from all over. We hear them in our own tongues speaking the mighty deeds of God. Okay. Um, so the Holy Spirit came, it sounded loud, it was like the sound of a loud, violent wind, and then suddenly there appeared tongues which distributed themselves over each apostle. Why do you think these fiery things look, look like tongues? They're speaking languages. Okay, so this is a visual confirmation of what God is doing through the Holy Spirit. All right, okay, so this is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter, as, as if you want to look uh, forward, verse 14, Peter is going to be the chief spokesperson, and he is taking his stand with the eleven to speak to this crowd, this multitude that is, has come together by first by that sound. What is the sound? Okay, and then by what the, the sign that they're seeing, the fiery tongues, um, and he's going to preach Jesus um, to, this, to this number of people um, for the first time. And I'm going to skip on down um, to verse 23. Um, I hate to do that. I always hate to do that, but we need to capsulize this. It says, this man, speaking of Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, which means God knew this was going to happen, and there's purpose behind it. And you with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him up from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. Death could not hold Jesus Christ. He was sinless. He was the Son of God, and he rose in victory from, from death. Okay, all right. Um, and then let's look at um, verse 36. He's 
uh, concluding the lesson, the sermon. And he says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter answered and said to them, Repent, and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then verse 40, um, with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who received his word were baptized, and that day were added 3,000 souls. And that is the first day of the church right there. 3,000 on the first day of the church baptized into the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, so uh, let's just look at our uh, map here for a second. If you have your map, not the one I just gave you, the one that's connected to your lesson. So here is Jerusalem, and that is where the church began, the city of Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost. Okay, um, let me refer to my lesson for a moment here. All right. Um, so what we see in, in uh, the weeks and days and the uh, early time of the church, the year, first year of, of the church, is we see tremendous, tremendous growth. Um, in Acts 4.4, 4, we're not going to read it, um, we see that 5,000 men only have been converted um, so we're not we're not adding in the the women uh, yet. I mean, but there's more, of course, right? But just counting the men, there's five thousand. In the next chapter, in Acts five fourteen, we see beyond that multitudes. It says multitudes are added, both men and women. And then in chapter 6, verse 7, I love this one. It says, the numbers increased greatly. So we have, we have a multiplying factor here, or almost a geometric factor here of, of people coming to the Lord. Uh, we're talking about thousands upon thousands. And it says, the number increased greatly, including a great many of the priests. Is that not the coolest thing ever? Some of the leaders that, that were instrumental in putting our Lord to death are now believers and a part of the early church. It says a great many priests. That is thrilling. Okay, so what is going to happen here? Well, guess what? You know, all those people, Cappadocia and Pontus and, and uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia and all that, they don't want to go home. They don't want to go home. They need to be taught. You know, you can't just get baptized and, and go home, right? So many stay. Many stay. But you know what happens? I mean, there's great hospitality taking place in the church. You can read Acts 2 about people sharing meals together and eating together and, 
and people selling uh, property and all of that to those who have need. Well, who has need? Well, these people have need. You know, if you came for a, a feast and the feast is over and you were expecting to go back to Rome or Crete and you decided, no, 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 this is too important. We've got to stay here. I gotta learn. I gotta. I gotta be prepared. Then there's great needs in the church, but the church rose to the occasion, and people began sharing not just possessions but tracts of land in order to meet these needs. And if you want to go with me to Acts chapter four, verses 32 through um, 37. There's more of these passages you could read, but um, we're just going to stick with this one. It says, uh, 432, all the believers were of one mind and one heart. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales. And they put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So we see great generosity and sharing. And like the author brings out, people have tried to use these texts in the early chapters of Acts to promote the idea that the early church were uh, socialists or communists or something like that. No, people still had houses and people still had property. A lot of times what they did is they sold an extra thing. They didn't sell the house out for themselves. They, they sold an additional house or a tract of land that they might have. And there was great sharing, but it was not, it was not communist. All right, um, well, we're going to see some growing pains now in the early church. And the first one takes place in chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Um, apparently, they're seeing people being generous, just like Joseph, uh, Barnabas, um, and they decide to do something um, Dishonest, I guess is the word to use. All right, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Nothing wrong with selling it, nothing wrong with giving part of it. The problem is that's not what they were saying they were doing. They were giving the impression that they had sold this land and given all of it to the apostles for distribution. All right. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept back for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, right there. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. So this is, this is a wake-up call to anybody who's not sincere, to anybody who's 
tag along with the early church because it's popular or because it's growing or because it's large or because it's the thing to do in Jerusalem, okay? So um, this is a very sobering event for, for everyone. Um, in fact, if you want to look, let's see where I am here, at, um, great fear coming over the church again in 11 and the powerful acts and wonders of the apostles and verse 13 it says but none of the rest dare to associate with them why because you don't mess with it you know, we better not mess with this okay we they heard what happened and we're not you better not take this lightly this is serious business okay However, the people held them in high esteem. Verse 14, we've read this already. And all the, all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly being added to their number. So it's, it's making a division, a separation between um, people who are insincere. They're, they're not going to mess with this now. But sincere people are still being converted, still being added. In fact, large numbers, if you just read that, large numbers. So that is the first situation that really brings a seriousness to this new movement that people are experiencing. Well, it's not long until there's persecution as well because the, the leaders are not happy, right? They thought they killed him, right? They thought this was gonna die out, and here it is exploding in numbers that they never dreamed right in front of them. And guess where they're meeting? Lots of times they're meeting in the temple courts to worship Christ and to learn from the apostles. All right, so in Acts uh, 15, I'm just gonna read one of the persecution passages. Uh, starting in verse 17, it says, then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out and told them, go back into the temple and preach. So early the next morning, they're right there preaching and the jailer and the leaders don't know where they are. And they find out they're back in the temple and they're preaching again. Um, they, uh, arrest them again, they try to threaten them, and in verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Okay, yeah. Acts 5, verse 29. Yeah, Acts 5, 29. Did I say 4? Oh, I'm sorry. Great things happen there, too. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, yeah. Chapter 5. All right, so um, verse 29 once more. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Well, Gamaliel, who's actually the Apostle Paul's teacher, steps in because they want to kill him right now, right here, right now. And he says, you better not. If it's not from God, it's going to die out eventually. I'm paraphrasing, ladies. He said, but it is, if it is from God, you're going to find out that you're fighting against God. So you better let them just go. Well, they aren't completely happy with that, of course. So in, in verse 40, talking to Gamaliel, 
it says, his speech persuaded them. Then they called the apostles in and had them flogged. So this is the first violence against the apostles. Then ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Christ. Okay, we're not going to read the, the next one. There's seven appointed because there's a, a new issue. This is now, that was external pressure, right? It's coming from leaders. It's coming from without. But now there's an internal um, strife because there are widows who are daily being given food to eat from, from the, the church, from donations of the church. And like we said, there's a lot of people there who are from elsewhere. So you've got Hellenistic Jews, uh, widows rather, which means they're, they're foreign widows. Hellenistic means of Greek culture, and the whole Roman Empire was Greek culture, even though it was Roman, it still had that culture and that language. So some of uh, the widows, the non-Jewish widows, are bringing it to their attention that they're not being fed. They're not getting uh, food. So the apostles come together and they choose, with the help of the congregation, seven men, and they designate them for this task to make sure the, the food is distributed to those widows. And guess what? They choose all um, Hellenistic men. All of those seven have Jewish, uh, excuse me, Greek names. And there's two that are prominent that are going to come up next. So let me just mention them. One is Stephen, and the other is Philip. And they become very, very uh, mighty and influential in the early church. All right, let's go on now to um, the next section, which is Stephen. Um, Stephen and Philip uh, have their, well, also have hands laid upon them by the apostles. You can read that in the first seven or eight verses of the chapter, uh, chapter six. And uh, they are able uh, to speak powerfully as well as now uh, perform miracles. Um, but Stephen is a mighty speaker. And um, what it says about him in Acts chapter six, verse eight, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people, and he preached. And in verse 10 it says, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. You see that? So it's like there's nothing they could do. There's nothing they could say. There's no way to uh, respond because everything he is saying is so true and so right and so powerful. Okay, jump down. Jump. You have his, his sermon, or at least a good bit of it, in, the, in the, the part that comes afterwards. So now we have to go to chapter 7 after that sermon, which is a great history lesson on the uh, Jewish people. He really summarizes the history beautifully. But in Acts chapter 7, verse 57, it says, I mean, they just can't stand it anymore. Um, at this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. And they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, 
Stephen prayed, Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So now violence has turned to death. Not just beating, not just flogging, but death. And Stephen is the first Christian martyr, the first to die for Jesus Christ. There will be others. Well, at this, a full-blown persecution breaks out. Just breaks out, like a dam bursting. And if you want to continue on in um, chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul was there giving hearty approval to his death. And on that day, that very day, the death, the death of Stephen, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So now here we go. They're being, they're being uh, evicted and scattered from Jerusalem. They're going to go into Judea and Samaria. The gospel is now going to go out. Um, all right. Why do you think the apostles got to stay in Jerusalem? That is still the center of the church. And they need to stay together. They're going to stay together. Many, many things are going to take place in Jerusalem that need the apostles there. But everyone else gets scattered. Okay. Um, Verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. And it's true. He was affected. It is true. He began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off women, men and women and put them in prison. But those who had been scattered preach the world, word, wherever they went. How did Jesus say it was going to happen? Look back at Acts chapter 1. First in Jerusalem, then Judea, and Samaria. See what's happening? All right. Okay, and so now let's go to our other of the seven. We talked about Stephen. Let's go on to Philip. Um, so Philip, if you want to go to Acts 5, I mean, Acts 8, verse uh, 5, same, same place. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and began to pro proclaim Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. And he was performing miracles. He was healing paralyzed people and the lame and all that. And verse 8 so there was great joy in that city. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So the gospel now is going out to Samaria. And you know that Samaria has a kind of a mixed heritage. Um, the Assyrians, uh, when they invaded uh, Samaria back in um, what was it, 722 BC, they cleared everybody out and they brought in refugees from other lands that they had conquered and repopulated that area. So originally it was no Jews whatsoever because of what the Assyrians did. But over time, there was some intermarrying. So what you have now is you have a mixed people. Still, probably most are just a little bit Jewish and mostly not. But they do follow the law. 
they follow the first five books, and they have a semblance of belief in Jehovah God. So that's the next place where the gospel is going to go. All right. Um, and then I'm not going to read this because we're so late um, already. But um, Philip also is sent directly by the Holy Spirit to um, Gaza. He leaves Jerusalem. Or... Yeah, or actually he's on the road um, to Gaza. Um, and he meets what we always call the Ethiopian eunuch, who is a proselyte, right? He came to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning home with his entourage. And guess what he was doing? He was reading the prophet Isaiah in his chariot. Have you ever thought about that? First of all, Isaiah is the longest book in the Old Testament. The scroll that they found in the Dead Sea, sea Scrolls is 27 feet long, written on both sides. So that's what he has. That's expensive stuff, ladies. Do you know how costly it was to buy scripture back then? Now, imagine, he bought, he bought the Primo book. He bought Isaiah, which is the longest book. And he is in his chariot reading it. This is a cool guy. This is a great guy. Okay. Um, did he buy it in Jerusalem? I wonder. Because he's going home from Jerusalem. Anyway, you know what happens. Philip runs up. The, the Ethiopian unit invites him. They go along. And wow, what happens here? He's reading Isaiah, of all places, he's reading Isaiah 53. I mean, how serendipitous or divine is that? And so Philip picks up right there and preaches Jesus to him. And then in verse 35 it says, um, Philip began at that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders for the chariot to stop. They went down, both Philip and the eunuch, into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Okay, so um, let me just briefly give you the, the rest of your map here, and I'll let you go. I feel really sad because um, Peter is, is sent to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and I, I encourage you to read that. Um, and, and now the gospel is really going to go out because uh, Cornelius is the first Gentile to hear the gospel and become a Christian. Remember, we talked about this, ladies. Peter uh, was the first to confess the identity of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And at that moment, Peter was given a privilege. He says, you are Peter, and I am going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What did he do? Open doors. Who was the primary spokesperson on the day of Pentecost? Peter. He opened the door of the church on the very first day to all those people there. And then God sends Peter, specifically Peter, to Cornelius 
to preach the gospel to the first Gentile convert to Jesus Christ. Peter opened the door to the Jews. Peter opened the door to the Gentiles. And from this point on, the gospel is going to go out. The gospel is going to go out to all of the entire Roman world. And I'll, I'll just put this up here. So Cornelius is in Caesarea. But the gospel is going to go, and people are going to carry it wherever they go. That scattering just did wonders. I know that they thought they were going to squelch the church, but all it did is diffuse the seed everywhere. And so what you end up having here, not too long after the conversion of Cornelius and Caesarea, is you have the gospel being preached to Jew and Gentile alike in huge numbers and the first congregation that is Jew and Gentile together, and it's a beautiful congregation, it's a powerful congregation, it's got leaders and teachers and prophets, and the Christians will be The followers of Jesus Christ are the first called Christians here. I'm going to say a prayer and let you go. Um, Julie, we're, I, I'm okay with not reading the conversion of, of Saul because we're going to do Saul. We're getting ready to do Saul. We've got one lesson I'm thinking between. We're going to do um, the life of Saul. Paul. All right. Dear Father in heaven, um, thank you so much for what you did. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you for saving our souls. Thank you that anyone, anyone who calls on the name of Jesus Christ can be saved. Thank you for giving us forgiveness um, through Jesus, through his blood and baptism. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit into our hearts um, as a seal. Um, help us, Father, to be thankful for his activity in our lives. Help us to listen to uh, our conscious and conscience as he prods us. Thank you for the church. Thank you. The church exists today, God. The church is here today. What was started by Jesus, purchased by Jesus, and what was proclaimed by the apostles, it's here today, Father. It still exists, and there has never been a generation without the church. There's never been a generation without Christians. And we give you thanks to be a part of the Christian age, to be a part of the kingdom of God, to be a part of the church. All these things we, we thank you for in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.